today I am going to discuss about the Cartesian theory of mind, the Cartesian theory of mind revisited. Descartes uh, as you know Descartes is one of the uh, important philosopher in the philosophy of mind. Without Descartes philosophy of mind it is very di difficult to explain the contemporary issues in philosophy of mind and cognitions. My colleague Professor Ranjan Panda has explained on the Cartesian dualism, but uh, I will be explaining something different from uh, what Professor Panda has explained. In these sections, I will be giving much importance on the uh, Cartesian concept of mind and how the Cartesian concept of mind is uh, important. Because uh, Descartes is one of the classical founders of non computational theory of uh, mind, uh, according to him, because the thought plays vital role in the case of mind, because the essence of mind is thought and the essence of the body is extensions and we cannot attribute essence of thought in a body, because uh, it is opposing each other uh, the, and the, there are strong distinction between mind and body uh, according to Rene Descartes. But Descartes is not denying the existence of body rather than he is accepting the existence body, but he is saying that mind is different from the body. The way he is explaining mind which is completely non computational and uh, non mathematical uh, even if, uh, non mechanical. Without a proper understanding of Descartes view of on the mind it is impossible to discuss contemporary philosophy of mind. Uh, in this sections, I will be explaining two important th things namely the existence of mind and its nature and uh, how Descartes idea of mind is non computational. In the first section I shall argue that William Hintika, Malcolm and many other philosopher philosophical arguments will not cope with Descartes notions of mind, uh, because the way they are defining uh, the notion of uh, mind is negating the existence of mind and also its nature. Secondly, I shall argue that Descartes idea of mind is non computational because the way Ryle, Quine and other functionalists or founder of cognitive scientists defined it is completely mechanical or behavioral and to which the notion of computationality is applicable and the mental qualities are credible to machines. This section is to clarify Descartes notion of mind from subjective point of view. I believe that Descartes notion of mind cannot be explained or characterized in a computationalistic approach that are the subjecting mental states which we can see from, from the first person perspective of their proper understanding. Uh, let us see the Cartesian mind its uh, nature. According to Descartes to know something implies that there is a mind. The existence of a knowing subject means that there is a mind again he tries to find out through his cogito argument that there is at least one knowing subject that is his own self. He arrives at this truth through his method of doubt. The method lead Descartes to argue that the whole body of knowledge might be mistaken. In Descartes uh, words I quote I will suppose then that everything I see is spurious, I will believe that my memory tells me lies and that none of the things that it reports ever happened. I have no sense, body, shape, extension, movement and place are chemerized. In this context, Descartes raises fundamental questions from the possible non-existence of the external world and our own bodies. Does it not follow that it is possible that we are ourselves do not exist? Again, he replied to above question is as follows. I quote, no, if I conceived myself of something then I certainly existed, but there is a deceiver of supreme power and coming who is deliberately and constantly deceiving me. In that case, I too undoubtedly exist if he is deceiving and let him deceive me as much as 
he can he will never bring it about that i am nothing so long as i think that i am something so after considering everything very thoroughly i must finally conclude that this proposition i am i exist is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind thus to think that one does not exist one must exist therefore once one non existence is un inconceivable if i deny my own existence the denying itself presupposes my own existence for decades cogito ergo sum is an indubitable proposition doubting one's own existence presupposes one's existence now the question arises what is the nature of the statement cogito ergo sum is it a syllogistic inference like whatever things exists i think therefore i exist for decart it is not a syllogistic inference it is a, rather a self evident truth known by a simple intuition of the mind thus scholars are uh, divided among them, themselves as to the exact nature of the transitions from cogito to sum william has shown there is something unique about cogito which cannot be replaced by any other verb from instance ambulo ambulo ergo sum is not as self evident as cogito ergo sum moreover unlike william hintika argues that cogito ergo sum is not an inference but a performance he says the function of the word cogito in decart's dictum is to refer to the thought act through which the existence existential self verifiability of i exist manifests itself for him the relation of cogito to sum is similar to the relation of a process to its product the truth of i exist is revealed to one only when one actively thinks just as there is illumination only when there is source of light exist the truth of i exist cannot be revealed by any arbitrary human activity such as breathing etc but only by thinking an attempt to think one's own non existence amounts to persuading oneself to the belief that one does not exist though each thought include the thought of one's own non existence the truth of some is verified this self is coming to know its own existence and it is revealed in the act of thought according to decades the thought act is due to the thinking thing which is the self for him again the thinking or the self is that which but what then am i a thing that thinks what is that a thing that doubts understands affirms denies is willing is unwilling and also im imagines and has sensory perceptions the existence of of the thinking thing is the same as the existence of the knowing thing from this statement it follows that there is a mind which has the power of knowing something and if there exist at least one mind it is logically and even if empirically possible that there are other minds now the question is if there is there is or there are minds what is the nature or essence according to rene descartes thought is the essence of the mind the essence of a thing is defined as that which is necessarily for its existence and if it has a no necessary a relationship then we cannot accept its existence therefore thought is the essence of mind the similar way extension is the essence of the body without extensions you cannot imagine a body if you imagine some kind of extended things is existing in this space and time then we have to predict that something is existing we cannot think that something is existing which has the properties of extensions but it is not existing in the space which is one of the contradictory statements therefore descartes claims that he has clear and distinct perceptions 
or awareness that he is a thinking thing and nothing other than uh, thought belongs to his nature. But on the, on the other hand, Malcolm argues that in identifying thought as mind's essence, Descartes employs the following principles. X is my essence if it is the case that A, if I am aware of X, then necessarily I am aware of myself and B, if I am aware of, I am aware of myself, then necessarily I am aware of our two X. Thinking satisfy these conditions. Ergo, thinking is my essence. Malcolm illustrates how thought alone satisfies the single principle that any act of thought for Descartes is identical with the act of consciousness. Consequently, if I am aware of anything, then I am thinking and so if I am aware of thinking, then I am thinking and if I am thinking, I am aware of thinking. In Malcolm's view, though Descartes does not explicitly maintain that whatever I think, therefore I am aware of myself, he would be drawn to accept it partly because the best support for his principle, I think ergo I exist is at the same time a support for the principle I think ergo I am. I am aware that I exist. So, thought satisfies the conditions A of the above principles. It also satisfies the condition B as they as every act of awareness of myself is also an act of my awareness of something other than myself. Since acts of thoughts are identified with acts of consciousness. It follows that cognitive acts are conscious acts. So, far as Descartes concept of mind is concerned, uh, because Descartes mind is one of the important aspects of cognitive states and process is their phenomenality. Our perceptions, understanding, judgment and many other mental faculties can be defined and explained only in relation to consciousness. According to Descartes, the mind is a thinking substance endowed with various faculties such as sensory perceptions, understanding, willing, etc. For him, it is one and the same mind which wills, understand and has sensory perceptions. Moreover, Descartes grant that the mind is associated with the body and mind provides metaphysical support to the body. This derives him to the examination of the nature of the body in its metaphysical aspects that is body in the most general sense of the term. The most general concept of mind attained through a clear and distinct perception of the intellect is that it is an extended substance, a continuum with three dimension of length, breadth and height. As in the case of the mental substance, the extended substance too is known through its acts or modes which according to Descartes are shape, size, position, motion, rest, etc. Therefore, this shows that Descartes idea of mind is something non-computational. Let us see how the Cartesian mind uh, is non-computational. Till now, we have discussed the Cartesian mind and its nature. In the Cartesian scheme of mind, there is no place of for computationality, because the thought act is due to the subjective thinking thing, which is the self. Again, the subjective thinking thing or the self is that which doubts, understands, affirms, denies, is willing, is unwilling and also imagines and has sensory perceptions. The existence of the thinking thing is same as the existence of the subjective thinking thing, because it is the subject who thinks all these subjective activities are non-computational because the subjective activity is not mechanical. If it is a mechanical, then we can define it objectively. Therefore, Cartesian mind is subjective mind and which we can able to explain from the first uh, person perspective. The mental processes for Descartes are intentional and are the free acts of the thinking subject. Hence, they cannot be mapped mechanically in an 
ergonomic way or ergonomic system. Descartes concept of I think presupposes subjective experience because it is I who experience the world. Descartes notion of I negates the notion of computationality in the mind. The essence of mind is thought and the acts of thoughts are identified with acts of consciousness. Therefore, it follows that cognitive acts are conscious acts, but not computational acts. Thus, for Descartes, one of the most important aspect of cognitive states and processes is their phenomenality, because our judgments, understanding, etcetera can be defined and explained in relation to the consciousness, not in relation to computationality. We can only find computationality in machines and not in the mind, which wills, understand and judge. Descartes dictums, I think therefore, I am not only establishes the existence of the self who is thinks and acts, but also its freedom from mechanistic laws to which the human body is subject. Moreover, when Descartes makes the distinction between mind and body, he did not say that the idea of the mind is that of a ghost, rather than Gilbert Ryle is positing or ascribing that there is a ghost in the mind and there is a ghost in the machines or there is a ghost in the body. Although he did not say, but although Descartes did not say that the idea of the body is that of a machine. Ryle in his book, The Concept of Mind says that Descartes distinction between mind and body is a myth. He argues, I shall often speak of it with deliberate abusiveness as the dogma of the ghost in the machine. I hope to prove that it is entirely false and false not in details, but in principles. According to Ryle, Descartes distinction between mind and body commits a categorical mistakes because Descartes is categorizing, dividing both mind and body and that division making one kind of categorical mistakes. As Ryle said, my destructive purpose is to show that a family of radical category mistake is the source of the double life theory. The representation of a person as a ghost mysteriously encoded in a machine and which derives from this argument. Because as it is true that a person's thinking, feeling and purposive doing cannot be prescribed solely in the items of physics, chemistry and physiology. Therefore, they must be described in complete counterpart idioms. As the human body is a complex organized unity, so the human mind must be another complex organized unity. Though one made of a different sort of stuff and with a different sort of structure or again as the human body like any other parcel of matter is a field of causes and effects. So, the mind must be another field of causes and effects though not heaven be praised mechanical causes and the mechanical effects. In Ryle's understanding of mind becomes as much mechanical as the body is therefore, non different from the body. However, Descartes refused the mechanistic reading of mind as we have seen Descartes is a dualist rather than a mentalist. Descartes argument for the mind which is distinct from body needs to be understood as an argument for the logical possibility of their separate existence and not for the fact that they exist independent of each other. The separability argument is as follows. Firstly, I know that everything which clearly and distinctively understand is capable of being created by God or so as to correspond exactly with my understanding of it. Hence, the fact that I can clearly and distinctly understand and one thing apart from another is enough to make certain that two things are distinct, since they are capable of being separated at least by God according to René Descartes. The question of what kind of power is required to bring about such a separation does not affect the judgment that the two things are distinct. Thus, simply by knowing that 
I exist and seeing at the same time that absolutely nothing else belongs to my nature or essence exactly that I am a thinking thing. I can infer correctly that my essence consists slowly in the fact that I am a thinking thing. It is true that I may have or I may have or I may anticipate that I have certainly have a body that is very closely joined to me, but nevertheless on the one hand I have a clear and distinct idea of myself in so far as I am simply a thing that non extended thing and on the other hand I have a distinct idea of a body in so far as this is simply an extended non thinking thing accordingly it is certainly that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. Descartes has already proved in the second meditation the existence of a thinking being who has a clear and distinct perception of mind as a thinking non extended thing. This is a proof of the non mechanical mind which is different from the body subject to mechanical laws. Similarly, in the fifth meditation he has shown that he has a clear and distinct idea of a body as extended and a non thinking substance. This is to suggest that a mechanically existing body is ontologically distinct from the non computational mind. The above distinction between mind and body supposes that there is no ghost in the human body or ghost in the machine. Descartes did not admit the existence of a ghost in the machines. Had Descartes admitted that there was a ghost in the human body, then the mind itself would become computational and there would be no necessary distance between mind and body. Because the ghost itself is a body, but Descartes admits that the distinction between mind and body and this shows that the mind is non computational. It is this mind which has the capacity of intelligence and understanding. The Cartesian way of, of understanding of the concept of intelligence is anti physicalistic and anti behavioristic and hence is anti computational. The human mind is beyond the sphere of computationality because the human mind has innate ideas which are embedded as the innate disposition of the human mind. These ideas are a priori in the human mind and are the basic inborn propensities. Descartes observes my understanding of what a thing is, what thing, what truth is, what thought is seems to derive simply from my own nature. But my hearing and knowledge as I do now or seeing the sum of sum or feeling the fire comes from thing which are located outside me or so I have hetero judged. The above observation of Descartes shows that innate ideas are not produced in us by senses. If the ideas were conveyed to us by the senses like heat, sound etcetera, we would not have to refer to anything outside ourselves, they too would be innate. For Descartes, the ideas of pain, colors, sounds and the like must be all the more innate if on the occasion of the certain corporeal motions, our mind is to be capable of representing them to itself for there is no similarity between these ideas and corporeal motions. Here it follows that there is a distinction between innate and advantageous ideas and that innate ideas are universal ideas whereas, advantageous ideas are particular ideas. As Descartes points out that hearing a noise, seeing the scenes and feeling the fire are all particular ideas. Again it must noted that the perception of the particular is not possible without the universal. Innate universal ideas are necessarily required for the cognition of the particular objects in the world. The following Descartes, Chomsky establishes that language too is an innate faculty of the human species. Language becomes the essence that defines what it is to be human. 
language is purely a syntactic system according to Chomsky and it therefore has a logical form which is universal and innate world. Language must also have been a, an essence something that makes language what it is and inheres in all languages that essence is called universal grammar. Language does not arise from anything bodily studying the brain and the body can give us no addition insight into language. The basic tenets of Chomsky's linguistic are taken directly from Descartes. The only major tenets of Descartes and Chomsky rejects is the existence of the mental substance different from the human brain. Chomsky accepts that the human brain embodies the innate grammatical structure. Like Chomsky, Quine also affirms that there can be no philosophical study of mind outside psychology. Progress in philosophical understanding of the mind is inseparable from progress in psychology because psychology is a natural science, studying a natural phenomena that is a physical human subject. Quine argued a dualism of mind and body is an idle redundancy. Quine holds that corresponding to every mental state, however fleeting or remotely intellectual, the dualist is bound to admit the existence of a bodily state that obtains when and only when mental one obtains. The bodily state is trivially specifiable in the dualist's own terms simply as the state of accompanying a mind that is the mental state. Instead of ascribing the one state to the mind then we may equivalently ascribe the other to the body. The mind goes by the bound and will not be missed. Quine's position is that there are irreducible psychological properties, but all explanation is ultimately physical and his account of mental concept emerges as he examines how we acquire them and how we learn. He explains such terms are applied in the light of publicly observable symptoms, bodily symptoms strictly of a bodily states and the mind is as may be. Someone observes my joyful or anxious expression or perhaps observes my gratifying or threatening situation itself or hears me tell about it. She then applies the word joy or angst or anxiety. After another such lessons or two, I find myself applying those words to some of my subsequent states in the in case where no outward signs are to be observed beyond my report itself. Without the outward signs to begin with, mentalistic terms could not be learned at all. Quine opposes the Cartesian dualism and therefore arrives at a behaviorist and functionalist concept of mind. He reduces the mental states like beliefs and other propositional attitudes to functional states. If both Chomsky and Quine are right about the nature of mind, then Descartes view of mind is wrong. That is, if that human brain is the cause of the mental states, then we cannot but arrive at the conclusion that the mental states are causally computable within a physical system. Chomsky and Quine define the mental qualities in terms of physical qualities. Therefore, they define mind in terms of, of the computational functions of the brain. But in the case of Descartes claim, but Descartes is claiming that all ideas in the mind are mental representational. In the third meditation, Descartes gives an extensive account of ideas. He says that thus when I will or am afraid or affirm or deny there is always a particular thing which I take as the subject of my thought, but my thought includes something more than the likeness of that thing. Some thoughts in this category are called volutions or emotions which others are called judgments. The above quotation shows that some thoughts are images of things. For example, 
they represent things in the world that is they have an object or content by which they are individuated as an idea of this particular thing or being. Descartes also considers an idea to the refer to form of the any thought. Descartes said that I understand this term to mean the form of any given thought, the immediate perception of which makes me aware of the thought. Hence, whenever I express something in words and I understand what I am saying, this very fact makes it certain that there is within me an idea of what is signified by the word in question. The ideas for Descartes are thus representational and intentional in character, because any ideas whatever we say we express it represents about the facts about the world which are mental as well as physical and in the terms of physical when we actualize the things. So, suppose I am feeling hungry and there is some intentional activities to the concept of hungriness and when I get my food then I satisfy my hungriness and here is it is com completely intentional and representational. But Descartes unlike Hobbes and Gassendi is not a naturalist and keeps the thought content free from naturalizers to which Hobbes and Gassendi are committed. For them thoughts are mechanical process in the brain. In reply to Gassendi Descartes says that I realize none of things that the imagination enable me to grasp is at all relevant to this knowledge of myself which I possess and that the mind must therefore, be most carefully be diverted from such things if it is to perceive its own nature as distinctly as possible. On the contrary Descartes hold that individual acts of imagination is as much as they are experiences are relevant to grasping the nature of the mind, because the mind is a thinking thing free from the mechanistic process of the brain. What separates Descartes dualism from the contemporary functionalism and identity thesis is not so much his distinction between and immaterial mind and extended material body, as his notion of the human being as a unit of a mind and body with the properties not reducible to either mind or body, but dependent precisely on their substantial union. Descartes hold that thinking cannot be explained mechanically. His argument that brutes cannot think is equivalent to an argument that machines cannot think. He thinks that no machine could have the capacity of using the linguistic and other science to express thoughts to give appropriate response to meaningful speech and the capacity to act intelligently or rationally in all sort of situation. But what is so special about human language use about what does it show that the behavior of any mechanism fails to show. A machine could be constructed to utter words corresponding to bodily change in its origin it could never use spoken words or the signs composing them as we do to declare our thoughts to others, because it is not conceivable that the machines should produce different arrangements of words, so as to give an appropriately mechanical answer to whatever is said in its presence as the uh, dualist for men can do. Secondly, if though such machines might do something as well as we do them or perhaps even better they would inevitable fail in others which could reveal that they were acting not through understanding, but only from the disposition of their organs. Whereas, reason is a universal instrument which can be used in all kind of situations their organs need some particular disposition for each particular actions. Hence, it is morally impossible to have enough different ones in a machine to make it act in all 
contingencies of life in the way in which our reason make us act. What Descartes is drawing attention here is that firstly no machine could have the capacity to use linguistic and other science to express thoughts and to give appropriate response to meaningful speech. Secondly, machine could not have the capacity to act intelligently in all sort of situations. Here, animal communications have not offered in counter evidence to Descartes assumption because human language is based on an entirely distinct principle nor has modern linguist dealt with his observation in various ways. For Chomsky, the main lesson to learn from the Cartesian tradition in linguistic are the ideas of an innate universal grammar and the ideas that are study of structure of this argument will reveal the structure of thought or mind. Descartes argument that brute or machine cannot think in the light of the general questions what makes an utterance or a symbolic structure is meaningful. The kind of automatic rule governed computations or symbol processing that a Turing machine instantiates and that can be performed by electronic computers would not count as thinking in Descartes sense nor would the mechanical operations of a computer or robot no matter how ingenious or intelligent count as rational behavior as he understand it. Not only is much a view of if thinking too narrow, it is based on the precise the kind of category mistake that Riley attributes to the Cartesians which I have already discussed. But Descartes himself is not guilty of explaining thought in terms of extensions. As Pradhan clarifies that Descartes is not a reductionist as he feels that mind cannot be reduced to anything else and it must have an autonomous existence alongside the existence of the material body. The I think of the mental reality does not deny its I exist character in the world, rather it is an affirmation of it. In that sense, we cannot say that Descartes subjectivized the mental world and thus made it into a private world. He made every effort to keep an objective constraints on the subjective mind and thus he explains that there is a mind and which is distinct from the mind and he has categorically attributes the essence of mind is thought and the essence of body is extensions and this is because Cartesian doctrines of the mind and its inner experience does not assume that we know other minds as much as we know our own. That is the reason why Descartes called the I think the absolute basis of all our knowledge claims about others and the also external world. Thus, the self or the mind is irreducible, not explainable in terms of the body or machines, whenever mind or another another's. In view of this, we can say that the Cartesian philosophy of mind not based on a mistake and that it has shown the right way to understand of the mind. Of course, Descartes would not have accepted the idea of mechanical or computational or, art or artificial intelligence model of mind. He may still be considered an important forerunner of cognitivist and computational view of mind because the essence of mind is rational thinking and that rational thought or cognition can be studied independently of the other phenomena like sensation and emotions. That Descartes stated that body depends on mental phenomena to which mind refers to consciousness. Although Descartes did not identify mental thought with consciousness, emotions, awareness, but regarded that all those conditions of thought. While arguing the existence of mind, Descartes talk about that the mind acting in some particular location in the brain to contemporary literally talk about mental processes as computational activity in the brain. 
but Descartes would not have accepted the mechanical application of rule on syntactic structure as a sufficient condition for a rational symbolic manipulation. The kind of automatic, the rule governed computation or symbol process that a Turing machine instantiates and that can be performed by electronic computation would not count thinking of the Cartesian point of view, because thinking is neither irreducible nor understand in the mechanistic way. And he has clearly mentioned that consciousness is a necessary condition for the thought and without consciousness it is very difficult to explain thought and mind. And it is consciousness which is belongs to the self and it is because of that mind is different from the body and it gives one kind of metaphysical explanation on the mind not a metaphorical explanation on the mind. But Cartesian mind is able to explain mind different from the body. Thank you.